Hi, welcome to Gilboy's YouTube channel. In this video presentation, I want to demonstrate how you can easily strip and refinish your G-Plan mid-century teak coffee tables or teak furniture. Um, this process can be applied to all sorts of furniture, but for this one, it's this lovely G-Plan uh, suite of three coffee tables. And I'll, I'll just crack straight on and show you what you need uh, to do this process. So, first of all, all the health and safety. We need some gloves for the stripper, some coarse wire wool. Now you wear gloves. These fine strands of wire here can cut your fingers, so really you want to be handling them with the gloves on, but that's sort of a removal of all of the polish later on. Um, some coarse sandpaper. This is 120 grit, there you go. 120 grit sandpaper. A sanding block for sanding the surface. With this block actually is one I made or have since I was an apprentice. It's just a lump of hardwood. I think it's a hardwood in there. With a piece of carpet. That's just a piece of carpet that's been glued to it. So it's a nice, easy thing to make at home. You don't have to buy a sanding block. Um, mask. Stripper. Now the stripper I'm going to be using actually is an industrial chemical one, which we're under license to use in here. Um, it's fast acting. The ones you can buy at the domestic sort of areas, is they're going to be water-based, I would have thought. Uh, they're not going to be quite as fast acting. But the process I'm showing here you will still get the same results with it. Um, but I will also be neutralizing this afterwards. Again, I don't know whether you need to do it, but I'll touch that later on. A scrape of some sorts to scrape away all the goo and gunk off the table. Some goggles. And this is just a decorator's painting tray to slop all of the stuff into. So. You don't need too much stuff, really. Right, let's crack on. Let's drop that down. Sorry if it gets a bit muffled from here on in, but I've got to put a mask on. So, like I said a minute ago, this is a chemical stripper, solvent-based one. Um, application of stripper, it's the same as you do for the water-based one. It's not a case of painting it on the surface. I just want to pour it on and move it around. Like so. And the glasses are fogged up and I can't see anything, but still. There we go. You want to get lots of this stuff on. Don't be shy with stripper. You really want it to bite into the surface. Obviously, you'd probably be doing this outside or in a garage. You wouldn't necessarily do this inside. I don't think you'd be too popular. See, I'm just moving it around. I want it to penetrate into that two-pack polyurethane original finish that they have here, which is common on G-Plan, all that mid-century furniture. It's a really good finish, actually. It was a really hard finish. And what we hope to do today is replicate that finish, but 
in some, just some easy steps really. It's just a strip, sand, seal and wax. So. I'm just moving it around on the surface as it dries into, into that old finish that's there. Let the stripper do the work. Now, there is a, I have been having a few emails um, from people who have been using a different type of stripper where you lay the stripper on like this and then put cling film over it and leave it. Um, I'm sure it does work. I'm sure it does work quite well. But the thing is, is if you put cling film over a stripper, you're forcing all those chemicals into the surface of the wood. Because if it dissolves the finish and then forces into the wood, it's going to stay there. And if you leave it for hours, the problem is then, once you've cleaned it all back, it might seep back through and retard the finish drying that you're going to apply to it. So I don't really like the idea of putting cling film over it. It needs to soften the finish. We're going to get at it and strip it off as soon as it's soft. I'm not going to leave it on there for hours and hours and hours because I don't want it damaging and getting into the wood. We're going to do this process three times to make sure it's cleanly stripped. It's really important to make sure that you get all of the old finish. Preparation is key. I think, well, let's have a little look. So this is like a palette knife, a decorator's knife, filler knife, <laughs> different names. Yeah, see, there was the, although it's a great finish, it's a very thin finish that was on this table. And the strip has done its work. It's straight through to the teak beneath here. Okay, so that's where I'm going to get this tray. I'm going to tuck it under the end. I'm going to just work my way down. Actually, that's quite that's quite liquid in there. I could actually reuse that. We could actually move that to save you know money. That's still good stripper in there. We could put that back on there for the second strip. I can already hear some of you saying, why, why bother stripping? Why, why don't you just sand it? Why go through all the pain of, you know, all the gloves and masks and goggles? Why don't you just sand it? Well, if you were to sand this, just hit it with a sander, there's every chance you'll go through the veneer, and it is veneered. The hardwood, this, is a, this lip around the outside is hardwood, is solid teak. But this is a core of chipboard or a MDF, it's probably chipboard, and then veneered. So if you hit it with a sander, you could go through. And I'll demonstrate that later on on another video which maybe you'd have a look out for. I've got another G-plan table that I'm going to cut in half and I'm going to demonstrate the thickness of the veneer. So that's why I'm stripping it. I don't want really to do much sanding. It's just a light sand once it's stripped. Now you can see, obviously, I've concentrated on the top. I haven't done the legs yet. You don't necessarily have to do the legs. I will do the legs. But if you don't want to, you can put masking tape and mask off the legs and just strip and refinish the top. If you don't want, if, if the legs are in good condition, why bother? Just do the top. But I am going to carry on and do, do the rest of it. So we've had the first strip. Now the second, I want to use this coarse wire wool. I'm just going to tease it open a bit. 
and I'm just going to scrub, scrub it clean. You can see it all coming off there, look. So I'm going to tease it open again, change the face, fresh bit. Well that's twice and it's gone but I am going to do it three times. I can't help it. It needs to be done three times. I was always taught to do it three times and you really want to make sure everything is gone. So I'm going to put a third application of the stripper on. Not too heavy this time, I don't need to. I'm just going to make it wet with the stripper. See, I'm not taking the brush off and slapping it around. You keep the brush on the surface as much as possible. Clean piece. Now this time I want to scrub it dry. So in effect, the wire wool is almost sanding the surface. You see, that's the third strip and you can see it's still coming off. Okay. There you go clean strip. Now we're ready to have a light sand, then I'm going to neutralise, let it dry, light sand a little bit and start finishing. It's that quick. Obviously I'm going to strip the base now actually, that's the next thing I'm going to do. We've done the top, I'm going to do the base. I've just moved the table at an angle so you can see this, but you can see the reaction of the stripper as it hits the polish, the old finish that's there. And you can see, look, watch that, look at that. Immediately it bites in and it fries up and reacts and you can see that straight away working. I think I mentioned this in the other video I did that um, my old former, my old boss, absolutely loved this, this process. Really, really enjoyed this process. In fact, he enjoyed it more than the actual French polishing and furniture finishing. He just really enjoyed stripping furniture. It was revealing all the old, uh, the, the wood beneath the old finish. I'm not going to use the um, scrapes or the, I'm not going to use these tools at all for this bit. I'm just going to go straight in with the wire wool to clean the frame because obviously it's a bit more awkward and it's easier to use the wire wool. As the wire wall clogs up, just keep on turning the face of it. Just open it up and get fresh wire wool around it. You can reuse this wire wall. Uh, once it all clogs up, leave it alone for a while. It, the uh, polish, the old finish, all the gunk dries. You can tease it without, shake it out like it's doing here on the surface and use it again.
Okay, so that's, that's the first strip of the bass. I'm going to do it another two times. But it, you see, it's quite quick, really. Okay, so that's, <coughs> that's the third strip of the legs uh, on this table. I've done the other two tables. Now we're at the point we're going to lightly sand the surface before I neutralise. And the reason I'm going to sand it straight after applying the stripper and cleaning it all back is because um, if there are any traces of wire wool, there are any traces left of this coarse wire wool on the surface and I was to neutralise, then may, it may have a reaction and little bits of, I think it's like an iron oxide that comes off and burns in the table. It reacts with the natural tannins. Oak, especially, if you're doing this on oak, uh, definitely sand and then neutralise if you need to. Don't go straight with the neutraliser because the chances are you'll get little burn marks from the reaction, a chemical reaction that happens with this wire wool. So that is why I'm going to sand now, then I'm going to neutralise, then we'll do a light little flick over with 180 grit sandpaper just before We'll let that dry overnight and then we'll seal and then go on the rest of the process of the finishing. All right. I think I'll, I'll put my goggles back on to save dust going in my eyes. All right, this is 120, or you can't see it on there, but it's 120 grit sandpaper. I'm just going to sand the top with the grain. I'm not going to go across the grain with this. It's too rough. I just want to key up this surface, uh, which will also help when I neutralise. So there you go. And I'm also, as I'm here, I'm going to tip this up a little bit so you can see it better. This centre panel here is veneered. Um, teak. Outside, the frame of this table is solid teak and obviously the grain on the outside here and here is going across. So I'm going to stop sanding, I'm going to stop around that edge because I don't want to cross sand that area because I'm just going to have to sand it out. So I'm going to try and keep with the grain as I'm working my way around. Oh, and one other thing, <laughs> one other thing, I'm using a block and sandpaper as opposed to a big orbital sander uh, for the reason I just mentioned a minute, minutes ago. This is a veneer um, and I've gone through veneers before in the past, but it's always happened, not always happened, it has happened before in the past. So I think to be safe, hand sanding when you're dealing with anything that's veneer based. Otherwise, you can go through, and if you go through, well, there's another video. I'm going to produce a video there's where we're showing on probably one of these G-Plan tables where I've sanded through, I and mean, you have to colour it. Um, it's, it's a tricky thing. I enjoy doing it as a French polisher, furniture restorer. It's not something you can really do at home, because if you sand through, that's it. It's game over, really, because you can't really remedy it unless you try staining it down, but it still shows. But anyway, that's why I'm using a block. Try not to come over onto the edge here to you get cross grain scratches going in the surface here. So just be careful around where the grain meets grain at 90 degrees. Just get your eye close to the surface. Now there'll be some people out there saying, why are you using such coarse paper? You don't have to go quite as coarse as this if you don't want to. 
Um, this has got varying colours over this and I just wanted to key the surface in. You can just sand this after you've stripped with maybe a 180 or 240 or if you really don't want to touch it at all and you want to preserve every single mark, ding, dent and colour on it, then don't sand it. Don't sand it at all. So that's the sort of thing I would do when I'm stripping antique period furniture where the finish is really bad but you want to preserve the patina uh, and the marks and dings and dents in the surface and refinish it. If you want to do that, that's fair enough, there's nothing to stop you but for this purpose I wanted to key into it. Also the other thing you might find is little scratches and marks. Don't, if you've got a scratch on a surface, I'm going to do a little line here maybe, pretend there's a, a scratch there. If you have a cross grain scratch, don't start, just keep on sanding the same area. Don't continually sand that area. Just keep on sanding around the whole top. Because if you concentrate in an area, you will tend to find that you will, you'll dip it slightly. And this being a veneer, there's a chance you'll sand through. So be very careful. Speaking of veneers, under here. This is a mahogany veneer, which is the balance veneer on the back of here. You can see that. That's mahogany there. It's mellowed and darkened down, but that's the same. And that's the balance veneer for the teak. And I say a balance because if you didn't have a veneer underneath for the veneer on top, this would warp and twist because it's probably got a chipboard core. But just to show you how thin a veneer is, I don't know how clever Jack's camera skills are, how close he can go to that, but that is thin, really, really thin. But that's what a veneer, but it's nothing wrong with veneer. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Look how well it's lasted for 40 odd years, 40, 50 years. And so, but you've got to be careful when you're sanding. Another thing to look out for when you're stripping furniture is this return edge under here, this lip. Just make sure you clean it because it's, it's just good sort of practice to make sure that this isn't got cleggy bits of old um, finish and stripper and anything under here. So make sure you clean it off. Right. I think we're done. Uh, so now you can use the vacuum to suck off all that dust. I am going to neutralize, let that dry, then a very gentle flick over the 180 and then we'll start the finishing process. Right, neutralising. So I need to neutralise the stripper that I've put on there. Uh, you may not need to do this. Have a look on the side of the tin that you're using for your stripper. You might not need to neutralise it. It depends on the, uh, what the solvent is, if it's water, but you might just wash it over. I don't know. But I'm going to use methylated spirits um, or denatured alcohol with a splash of acetic acid, which is vinegar, pickling vinegar. So if you had maybe um, 100 mil or 200 mil of methylated spirits in about 15 or 20 mil of, of acetic acid going in there, and that will help neutralise this alkali stripper that I've used on here. Uh, also, I quite like using meths on the surface because then I get to see the true colour of the timber and it sort of it, it points out any defects that I might have missed so using the meths wiping it over um, I'm going to use uh, a kitchen scrubby squeegee thing oh there it is there it is <laughs> so these one of these it's just a, a disposable kitchen scrubber they're, they're nothing they're pence a mere pennies um, but they're brilliant for this purpose because they've got a nice scrubby surface so anyhow slightly more user-friendly gloves. Take the old eyes. Right, okay. So I'm going to put in maybe, I don't know, 
There's about 200 mil of meths. This is our acetic acid. You can just use pickling vinegar, it just doesn't matter. I, I've got a bit of, there we go, that's enough. There we go, so that's neutralised. I'll do the other two smaller tables, let them dry for half an hour or so. Then we're going to lightly sand it and get on with the sealing process. So we're at the stage now where I want to lightly sand the surface before we're putting the sealer coat, um, our first sealer coat on here. And I just noticed something that I hadn't seen before now and that is there is a small ding or dent in the surface, if I hold that up, just there. Now given what I've just been saying about veneers and things and sanding, I can't go attacking that with sandpaper to get rid of it, although it's quite small, but it will possibly will show up and it will ruin what is pretty much a perfect finish. So there is, there is a little trick, and a little trick of the trade here I'm gonna show you. Anyone can do this, and especially with veneers, it's quite a good one to do. So I'm gonna show you how to get rid of that. Well, hopefully, hopefully get rid of it. I think it will work um, by using uh, an iron and some steam, and it uh, should be quite dramatic stuff, but let's give it a go. Okay, for the purposes uh, of the best way to steam this out, I'm gonna use some of our pure cotton cloth. I mentioned before how versatile this stuff is, it really is. I'm going to soak this in water. I'm going to cut off, oh, I don't know, so maybe about, about that amount. I'm going to soak it now in some water, just ordinary water, straight over the top of that ding and dent and then with a really hot, hot iron, an old iron, I don't know if you may be able to steal an iron from somewhere. <laughs> and in we go, okay. So I'm just placing this really quite wet cloth on the surface here, as you can see. And then the iron, tip of the iron on its hottest setting in. And the idea is it forces steam water to raise the fibres of the wood. Okay, so I just used the hairdryer there to take off the excess water that was around the outside. Um, I don't want water lying on the surface of the veneer. Uh, don't want to get near that chipboard underneath and then be in trouble. Yeah, so now I think I, I can still just about see it. It has raised it. You've got to be careful. As you saw, when I was applying the, uh, the iron to that. I was being very, very cautious. Um, it, it's something you can learn. Maybe practice on something that uh, you're not too worried about, first of all. And now I'm going to sand this uh, again with the 180. And if there is any small little, I mean, it's tiny to be fair. I don't think you're going to notice it. I think it's worked. Uh, again, 180 foam backed paper, a block. You notice, again, I didn't concentrate sanding here, I sanded the whole top. Uh, it, it's so tempting just to sand in one area, but it, honestly, just if you sand the whole, uh, the rest of the surface, it all ties in. And actually, it's worked a treat because I can't even see where it was. So it did work. So 
so I can show you. I can't see it, possibly because I'm not wearing my glasses, but actually <laughs> it's gone. That might come. But be very careful. Be very careful using that technique. Practice on something else to start with. But uh, yeah, it's worked. It's worked a treat. Um, I think we're at the point now of sealing up. Now, my preferred choice of sealer is a hard wax oil. I like to use the soft satin or matte. Satin's my prefer preference for this. You can use anything you like. You can use varnish, you can use wipe on poly, you can use linseed oil, you can use tongue oil, you can use teak oil, you can use Danish oil, you can use brush on lacquers. It's entirely up to you. But, <laughs> it may take a lot longer than you think when you're using those different things. Um, it depends if you're used to using them, especially the oils. Uh, the hard wax oils that are out, I think, are lovely. I think they're a really nice product. And it dries quickly and gives you a professional-looking finish. And you don't need huge amounts of experience to use it. And it doesn't penetrate in. So that's what I'm going to use. and use a hard wax oil, soft satin finish to it. I've diluted it to start with, just by 10%. Talking about it is here. Hard wax on, I'm gonna place it for a ring, no, it'll be okay. That's the stuff. Um, I've diluted it 10%, uh, white spirit. I mean, they, they, the manufacturers, you can have whatever the manufacturer says, but I put some, I think I have pure turpentine in this um, because it's oil-based. And I'm gonna apply it liberally to the surface using our cloths. Again, these stuff, the, our cloths, these 100% pure cotton cloths are, are brilliant um, for applying products. Uh, we use it for stain, we use it for buffing cloths, we use it for fadding, for French polish, but in this circumstance, I'm gonna use it to apply the hard wax oil. I'm just gonna shape it into a fad. And it's, I'm going to stick that in there now. Well, I'm going to put some gloves on first and then we'll stick it in there and it will be absorbed into the cloth, And which means I can control the amount of hard wax oil that comes out onto the surface. Well, as opposed to a brush, if you use a brush, you get a lot of um, wax oil will come out, hard wax oil that will come out or whatever it is you're, you're applying to one area. You're going to have to move it around on the table. Whereas applying it with a cloth, which is my preference. It's just a, a thing that I'd like to do. It's more controllable. There we go. Let's put some gloves on. You can see the level of the fluid going down as it soaks in. So I'm just going to start in this top right hand corner over to me and work my way across. So I'm just evening out what I've just applied. And boom, look at that. That's it. I'm going to leave that alone. Well, I'm going to do the frame and do the other tables. But I'm going to leave that alone, leave it overnight, and then tomorrow we'll come back, lightly denib the surface with 320 grit soft sandpaper, soft back sandpaper, and then either wax it or maybe give it another coat of hard wax or, and then wax polish it. 
but you can see, look at that, isn't that beautiful? Obviously it's not going to stay shiny like that, it's just because it's gone on wet. But. There, sealed up. Let's do the other two tables and let that dry overnight. Okay, so these have been drying for 24 hours. Uh, that first application of hard wax oil has, has worked wonders, actually. I think they look lovely. Um, I could lightly sand this with maybe some like 320 and recoat them. I quite like this sort of really matte look that they've got, even though I used a satin finished hard wax oil. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to wax these uh, now. So I'm going to go for a straight seal and then a wax finish. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use our rose gold on here, uh, which has a sort of a brown feel to it, a brownie, uh, brown mahogany colour really, that uh, I think will help just sort of enhance this finish here. So that's what we'll do. I'm going to use our soft wire wool. This is not the coarse, this is the soft wire wool that's available on our website. Really soft like cotton wool. I'm going to apply the wax with it over the surface, leave it for 20 minutes and then buff and we have a soft sheen. There you go, there's our, our rose gold. Looks quite dark but it's actually not that dark. Um, and a bit of our wild wool. I'm just going to make a little soft pad out of it and then I'm going to charge working it around, warming the wax up, getting it into the wire wool. I'm not going to dab this because I don't want to put little marks over the table that potentially could stay there. So I'm going to work from one end to the other with the grain, continually recharging as I'm going along. The action of using um, soft wire wool with the wax on the surface is actually lightly cutting it back at the same time. It's almost denibbing it so it will make it smooth. Still quite absorbent, still sucking in the the wax has been taken straight out of the of the wire wool and taken into that sealed surface. That's lovely. So we got Buckfist Abbey's beeswax in there. T1 grade carnauba wax, berry wax, Mirica wax, Japan wax, pure turpentine, pure gum turpentine, natural pine turpentine. The best ingredients I could get. You see I'm applying it with the grain. Any excess is just taken off. You just wipe off the excess with a, a dry bit of the wire wool. I'm just going to do that front edge, I can't really see it. Okay. Okay, well I'm going to do the the frame of the table as well, and obviously these these two here underneath. I'm just going to take them out wax the rest of the table and those two tables and then we'll leave it for 20 minutes or so. You don't have to use, you don't have to use the rose gold, I could have used the pure gold on this. I just fancied yet getting that sort of little bit extra colour and warmth to it when it buffs it would just give it a little bit more. OK, 
Okay, so we've waited our 20 minutes or so. I think it's just probably about half an hour. Uh, and now we're ready to buff. We wax polish this G plan table with some rose gold. Uh, and now I'm going to buff it. And we're going to use our buffing cloth. Again, you don't have to use our buffing cloth, but the reason that I like using ours is because it has a lovely open weave. You get two buffing cloths and you order it from us. Um, and if you order any uh, of the sort of one litre tins, it comes with it. And the polishing kits obviously come with it. But it's got a lovely open weave to the cloth, 100% pure cotton. And what that means is, is when I start buffing, it's not going to heat the wax up. The wax is going to stay on the table and we're going to buff the wax to a soft sheen. Uh, there might be a little bit of a transfer across, but if you use other uh, dusters or buffing cloths, if it hasn't got an open weave to it, you might end up smearing and getting the smudge marks, and you don't really want that. And you'll be thinking, oh, well, this wax isn't any good. Well, it's not really the wax. It's because you're using a, a, a cloth that's creating friction and heat, and you don't want that. So that's why we use these buffing cloths, uh, or this cotton cloth, which we use for lots of things. Right, I'm just going to start buffing. I'm going to buff half the table uh, and see what happens. Right. <laughs> and immediately, I can see there's a lovely, soft sheen. It always makes me smile. Sheen's coming to that. I don't know if the camera can pick that up. I'll uh, show you in a second. I'll just know if you can see that. That's half of it done. To me here, I can see the lights reflecting and see it on the surface. So we've just seen um, me buff this surface. You can see it's got a lovely soft sheen. Now, when you're doing this sort of finish, you can have different sort of layers of sheen uh, because of the way the nature of the timber and the way we've, we've sort of sealed and waxed. Now to get it to a back to a sort of dead soft, even uh, satin finish, you can use the wire wool again. Um, and this is very commonly done within the French polishing world uh, of dulling. I'm just going to use the wire wool. I'm just going to tease it open, as I always do, to, to make a pad. And then I'm going to start the top corner. I'm just going to go across the surface and with a little pressure, not hard, just a little pressure, I'm just going to soften the polish and the surface back down again. And it will even up the wax on the surface and you get that lovely, completely now soft, sheen to it. There's no sort of highlighted spots. And a lovely finish. You don't have to do that, but it's just another little trick. You can use the wire wool. I've had emails before of people saying that, the, you know, there's little higher shiny spots before when they're wax polishing things. And I said, well, just use a bit of wire wool, just gently over the surface, and it softens it back down again. And you get a lovely finish. And that will harden now over a few days. So if you wanted to maybe reapply wax, you wanted to put, we've, we've done a rose gold on here, maybe you want to put another coat on, you want to go with a pure gold over the top, no more colour. Wait three or four days, wait a week or so, let this wax harden and then put your wax on top. If you do it straight away, you think, oh, I want to put another wax. All you're doing is putting wax, soft wax, 
onto soft wax and you chances are you could end up with a bit of a mess really because the, the pure turpentine will soak into the wax you've just applied and soften that up so let it harden first there's no rush come back and do it in a week's time and build up those wax layers and you end up with that lovely wax build up um, which is so so nice there you have it we've finished uh, a very simple process hopefully easy to follow and you'll get professional looking results very quickly. Um, please head to our website www.gilboys.co.uk. Nobody says www anymore, but I just did, but there you are. Go to gilboys.co.uk and you find out lots more information about um, our polishes, our products and furniture restoration and how to look after things. Uh, speaking of looking after things, if you want to continue looking after your tables and furniture like this, you can wax polish this um, maybe every sort of year maybe for this, depending on how much use it gets, um, if it gets little use in a couple of years. Um, if you want to wax polish it just once more, if you think I want a bit more polish on it, just wait uh, a week or so before you put another wax straight on top of this. You want to build it up but then leave it for, you know, for as long as you like. But don't continually apply wax polishes um, day after day it will just melt into what you've got here and end up being a big sort of sticky mess so let those waxes dry before applying any more wax polish to it on and for maintenance wax waits of six months a year maybe longer depending on how much use you have but uh, anyhow thank you for watching please subscribe to our youtube channel hit the subscribe button hit the notification bell as well you'll be notified when we upload new videos uh, which we hope to on a regular basis now.